Okay. Just a few demonstrations, then we'll get into the today. So you guys learned a little bit about batteries today. Those are all down. Mm -hmm. Let's put this in here. So, yeah, we're basically plugging this into power. <clears throat> now here we have a cup that I put. We have we have brine, what they called it. Water with just salt in it, and it used to be a preservative for me. But it would be a lot more soaked with. with salt than what I just have in here. It would be really soaked with salt. Preserved meat and stuff. But um, <clears throat> If we crank this up. Crank the voltage up there. Can you guys see over here anything? Anything happening over there? Do you see anything? You don't see anything, right? You don't see any action, any bubbles, any chemical action going on? Yeah, Nothing? Bubbles on the Actually, I do see a few tiny little bubbles. A little bit of tiny bubbles. Actually, on the zinc. So what what this is? This is zinc and copper. Almost everything today is coated with zinc. Right. To prevent it from oxidizing. Silverware, almost everything. It's cheaper than anything else, and it's a good thing to prevent oxidation. And then copper, of course, copper usually oxidizes. That's why you got the green on, on all these buildings around here. Um, yeah, you can see a little bit. Now, if we turn this back down, if we take another cup of the same type of cup and we, we soak it full of uh, sodium or salt, then stir it around a little bit. Okay, move this over here. Now, do you see anything happening? Bowls <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, there's bubbles everywhere, right? And what, what is this mustard? Mm -hmm. What is this here? Hmm? What is that? Was brine? Mm -hmm. This is brine, and this is just water. Okay, okay, okay. Bottled water. Yes, sir. <laughs> How about the current flow? Can you check the current flow on the tube? It's more yeah. conductive with the salt. It's 0.6 amps. 0.6 amps. Yeah. Oh! Yeah. Well, there's a lot Quite a bit there. right there. Nothing now. <laughs> 0.009. So there's quite a bit more, more conductive in the body. Take the copper down. Oh, sorry, I had it short. It's hard to do. So 0.5. You see how I got it really close? See, it yes, actually sir. started eating the copper away. Yes, sir. Over here, what, that, what do you got over there? Away. Almost not conductive. So by adding. So why did it change color? It's actually eating the copper away. Yeah, yeah it does. The color the color. You can see that it's changing color there. Right. Yeah, it eats the copper away. I had it really close, so it was a really good effect right there. When, when they're really close, in order to make a really good battery, what you do... Now, here, now we're putting current in it. It's called electrolysis. Actually, those bubbles are... It's, ba it's basically breaking apart the hydrogen and the oxygen, H2O. It's converting the water to gas, really. It's breaking it apart. So that, those bubbles are hydrogen and oxygen. If you can separate those out, and there is a way to separate those out, then you can actually separate. Um, I didn't. I didn't have time to set it up today, but if I put water in this and put this is a fuel cell actually. If I put voltage through it, and that's platinum. That's why it's so expensive, platinum plated. But um, if you put electricity across this, then it'll separate the two H's and O H two O out you'll have twice as much hydrogen as you do oxygen per volume, even though they're not, you know, they're not really the same size um, atomically, the weight, but for volume-wise, you can get, you know, get the same. And then you can actually prove that hydrogen, that's hydrogen, how do you think you can prove that one was hydrogen, one was oxygen? Was one's going to burn, <laughs> and the other one's going to what? The other one's going to enhance burning. Right. Because oxygen promotes is, is what? Yeah. Promotes right. burning. So, one, you, you put a flame up inside of there and it'll, it'll, it'll make more flame. Right. Another one, you put a flame up in there and the flame gets bigger. Right. So, that's kind of proof that it's. Yes, sir. Um, what else do we want to show here? Um, 
So, it, just like just like we talked about the other day when we talked about the um, when we produced the piezoelectric effect, for example, you put I don't know if you guys saw on UCTV that same night they had a show on technology, but they had exactly what I said in class: the piezoelectric effect. And they're talking about how it's used in, in clock oscillators and stuff, but um, it's the same thing. Here, you put current or voltage in this, and you're getting an effect, which is you're getting a chemical action. Well, the the opposite is true as well, just like many other things in electronics or, or physics, chemistry. If you um, <coughs> If you put these two posts in here, then it also will produce a voltage. You can put a voltage in it and it produces a chemical effect, or you can just uh, put a complete the circuit with right. a wire, right. for example, um, and it produces effect. Now, now the effect is going to be much smaller. I don't know if you can really see anything, but you can you'll be able to see a voltage. So let's let's just do that. Can someone grab that voltmeter down there? Sure. On the bottom of that. What do you guys think it's going to be? Millivolts? Probably. You guys surprised that this can generate 0.9 volts? It's just, just a bar of copper, a bar of zinc. So what's the polarity? What do you? What's the polarity of this? Was that? Why was that minus over there? Let's move it over here and see what happens. What happens if I put more of this in here? Oh, I think it just went up. Does uh. Go up. Potato. Uh, <coughs> you can make a potato battery. You can make a lemon battery. It's the acid in there, or it's the uh, ions that are free to move as, as well. So. There's a lot of different, it's called the electrolyte. Anything that, uh, it, it's basically a liquid and it needs to be conductive. The more conductive, the better. Because actually, the electricity has to flow through the electrolyte or the liquid. So the internal resistance of the battery is going to depend on how well of an electrolyte you have. Um, <clears throat> yeah. No. Now, to, to get this, to get down the internal impedance, what do you think? It'd bring it closer would be better or farther away? Closer. Closer because the impedance is going to be less for that battery. Yes, sir. How about these plates? If you make them wider, is that going to have anything to do with it? I think it? it would cause it to be more. So. Yeah. So if you make them wider, the current is going to be, the, the resistance is going to be less because, you know, you can't change the voltage. Right. Change the current. Yeah. Yeah, it won't change the voltage. We'll the In fact, that's one of the voltage laws is that the, um, the voltage is not dependent upon the size of this, the configuration, anything. It only depends on the two materials, the, the two, the zinc and the copper. So if you have different metals, it'll do a different voltage, higher or lower. It only, yeah, it only depends on the, diff, the two materials, difference in the two materials, as far as the voltage is concerned. Now, the current depends on the configuration, the size of the battery, the size of the plates, and all that good stuff. Now, what's um, the current? It, it depends on. We'll go through it again. Okay. Yeah, we'll go through it. The best ones can use zinc. Zinc? Well, no, that's not the best ones. No, that's the first ones they use. Look at that thing. It's just like getting that thing away. Mr. Uh, what, what causes the water to turn green? Is it compositing? Well, the, it's eating away the copper. You see, it's changing it's awesome. color? Yes, it's, sir. it's on my finger. This is oxidation. No, it's, it's eating it away. Okay, okay, I got you. It's, it's, yeah, it's eating it away. Is it depositing on the zinc? Do what? Is it depositing on the zinc? No, it's positive on the copper. It says it deposited. No, it deposited. It's deposited. Oh! Is it deposited? Oh, on the zinc, yeah. Electroplate. Electroplate, that's what No, it, yeah, it, it's, it's doing that as well. That's, what's one way you can electroplate things? You put, uh, you pass current through. That's how you do some electroplate okay. process. Now, um, one other thing I want to do. Uh, Now, the effects of current. So, now this is going to be a pretty feeble current. In, in fact, let me turn this Let me turn this back on really quick. Okay, so I've got my voltage, right? 
let's say I wanted to check the the strength of this battery. This is the EMF, electromotive force. This is the force that tends to move electrons. It will cause electrons to move. In fact, if you stack two of these together, you can get this little watch thing to turn on. I just don't have time to do it today. But two of these in series will be enough voltage. 1.8 volts is enough to turn on this. Actually, 1.8 volts is typical standard low, low voltage CTL logic for these days. That'll turn that on. And then it'll make this buzzer buzz. But if I want to test the strength of this battery, I'm going to put this on current. And this is going to sort that out. <clears throat> Look at that. So that's 63 milliamps. So that would be the short circuit current for this battery. 63 milliamps. 63 which is enough to run a small microprocessor. Now, you know, you got to keep the bubbles off of here. Of this, you know, this, the strength. The strength will go down. Right. Now that's called the polarization. Supposed to be able to get rid of that by just shaking around, but you probably got so much copper in this ocean. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, now, so we—I wanted to show you that we can measure the current. Okay, the, the current. Now, if I did this with a car battery, of course, if I shorted that right there, it would blow the fuse because there would be so much current. Because it's, it's very strong. These, it has lots of these very wide parallel plates in there. Okay, and and so a different material had, for for example, lead acid battery. The the cell voltage is 2.1 volts, and there's six cells, so it's 12.6. That's the the normal cell battery. Okay, so you put these in series, and you can stack them. They add. So if you put this, so if I take this, it should be pretty obvious. If I take this, oh, here we go. Check this out. I didn't know I had it already created there. There we go. Some salt. Now, what do we do? We put those in series. Right. That's yeah. called series. Okay. Now, you have to make sure that you go from zinc to copper. You know, you can't do. You know, this is not going to work. You, you basically you just put them in reverse polarity. This is, it's kind of like taking a battery and you just you, you put one the, the both opposite of each other. Okay. You, know, you don't you don't stack them in the right series. So yes, it'd be it'd be sort of like going like this would be the correct series. You know to do like this. The the, the large bar indicates plus. The small bar indicates minus. Right. Or in other words, the, the large bar indicates copper, and the small one indicates zinc. Right. And so if you turn it, if you do copper and zinc, it's going to add zinc, okay. copper, copper, zinc, copper, zinc. But if you do um, zinc, copper, they're going to subtract. Now if I came in here and said this is ground, then I could have, I could have a plus, you know, 0.9 here and a plus 0.9 there, or if I turn it like this, I can have a, a plus and a minus. Minus 0 0.9 plus 0 0.9 relative to this ground. That's just a reference point. So, is everyone good with that? Uh, just really quickly since I'm here. Which, what's positive? This one? See the watch turn on? Mm-hmm. Cool. Good? Yes, sir. All right. So, everyone on Deserted Island? That's how you can pick yourself up. That way you won't be late. Also, the effects of this. Now, this would produce a current. Now, if you had a big enough coil of wire, yes, sir. another thing we're talking about is when current flows. Now, this is, generates a continuous current. <coughs> As the current we talked about the other day, we have static electricity. We can transfer current. We proved that. Now, in this situation, we are generating a constant current through the meter. We're gen generating a constant current mm -hmm. through the clock. Right. Now, as soon as the current would would move away from one zinc to the other copper and vice versa, then chemical action would occur, and it would continue to continuously generate more and more electrons or holes, or however you want to 
talk about it, right. at, the, at the electrodes. So it's called a continuous generated current. Okay, It's a chemical action. It's due to not only the... It, it has to do with the energy in the metal, actually. You know, the chemical... The, if you think about the metal, how is the metal made? It took a lot of heat, basically, right. to get that. That's a lot of energy. So you're basically extracting the energy out of the metal. That's okay. one way to think about it. Okay. Anything that takes energy to put something in, you can, you can extract that energy out. Okay. It's kind of like if I lift this up, and then right. if I drop it, I can use that energy. Right. Law of conservation of energy says that law, energy can never be created nor destroyed. So it's just trapped, it's trapped energy in this metal, cause it, and then you can extract that out. There's electrons, there's atoms in here. You have a chemical action, you can extract those things out. Um, and then once you run that continuous current through this, it just so happens that um, it produces a magnetic effect. First off, the magnetic effects of current. Turn this on. See there? Turn it off. Turn it on. My compass is not very good because it's getting stuck. But see there? It's lining up with north south of that turn of wire. All this is is a straw and some wire. Okay. See there? Yes. Sir. It follows it around. It can be shown by using statics that it's not the same effect as static electricity. The two are not related. Right. You take this magnet, you can put it up to the little pith ball, and or you know things like that, yes, I, and it wouldn't be attracted because that's aluminum, so it's not attracted to aluminum anyway. So it's a different effect, and you can also um, notice that it will suck the nail up inside of it. <coughs> Okay, it actually magnetizes the nail, causes the nail to become attracted to it, okay? That's called magnetic induction, actually. Awesome. We're talking about electric induction, where we had something that was electrified and it caused it to be drawn to it. Well, this is magnetic induction. Actually, what happens is, since this is, turns into a magnet, it magnetizes this with the north-south pole. It's induction. It's called awesome. magnetic induction. And so now that this is it's a magnet... magnetized. Yeah. Yeah, it magnetizes it. It's following Through induction. Come we call it... We call it induction. Maybe that's okay. why the compass wouldn't work. In the but now this is a magnet, so they're both going to act like magnets, and they're going to be drawn to each other. So that's all the demos today. I better start on the slides. We're not going to have time to, to finish anything. But okay. So this is one of the first batteries designed by Volta, Alessandro Volta from Italy. Oh, yeah, this projector is just going to show you um, the effects of a magnet. What did you say about the first battery, Mr. Alston? This is going to show, show you the magnetic field around a, a magnet. Okay. And it's actually the same with this. I don't know if I can get this over here or not. But How about the nail? Well, the, the nail, depending, it's probably going to be a little bit magnetized to the steel. See the effect? Oh. You guys see the effect of it? Yeah. How it modified it at the poles? See there? And this thing's getting warm too. 
I'm going to turn it down. Okay. So that, those type of experiments, those type of experiments are proof that there's a magnetic effect on current flowing through a wire. Are you convinced? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Sometimes people, you got to see things for yourself sometimes. So that's how we know. That, that's just iron fillings over there in some type of an oil. Historical timeline, we have in 1000 BC, uh, AD, compass. People were using compass to navigate, okay? They found it just lodestone, um, which is natural magnet. They could hang it in on a little needle. Just kind of like I, I, I suspended the wooden lath the other day in the middle, and then I was able to, to make it go around. That's the same principle of a compass, except for now that material would have to be magnetic. It would have to be a magnet on it. So the compass was used to navigate and to do exploration. And that's how we discovered even where we live today is it because of the compass. Um, so that's an instrument we can use to, to experiment with magnetism. That's the number one instrument that he used to do magnetic experiments is just a simple compass. Um, Gilbert in 1600 wrote a, a book on it. And uh, during Queen Elizabeth's day, stack electricity was 1654 is when they're working on that. Conductors, 1700. Leyden jar was the first capacitor around Benjamin Franklin's time, about around the beginning of our country, our nation. They're working on those sort of things. Um, electroscope. Then the gas lamp became popular for lighting, um, just in homes and in the streets, but it's kind of dangerous, 1790s. Batteries were invented by Volta. 1799. Some people say 1800. It's it's easy to remember. 1800, the very first battery. Everything everything in electronics is based on the battery. If you don't have the battery, you don't have anything. So that's where everything started. Is the battery. Um, easy thing to remember is 1800 is the battery. 1900 was the first wireless communication with Morse code across the transatlantic. So that tells you in 100 years we went from battery, which is very basic to transmitting Morse code um, Marconi from Europe to you know, the United States. Then we had, then it started taking off, it started exploding, 1810, arc lamps, electromagnetism, galvanometer, this is a galvanometer. The, ga the galvanometer is basically this analog meter. The idea behind that is, um, you put current in it, and it it's an electromagnet inside here, just like this. It produces what? A magnetic field? Right. Now, if you configure a needle just right, if I suspended this just in the right position with a spring on it, okay, if I configure this just right with a spring on it, you could imagine, oh, that when I have more current, it's going to go like this, right? Right. Just like we showed, that lines up with this. Yes, sir. That's all it is. That's all an analog meter is. You see that? Mm. It lines up like that. <clears throat> you just have this on a spring. What? Is it where you extract the state the right here that you're showing us? Yeah, I, I'll put these on the slide, on the Moodle. Okay, thank you. Then we have... Um, Magnetic rotations discovered, thermal pile. The thermal pile was been able to generate electricity with, with heat. Electromagnet, resistors, solenoid, which is what I just showed you. The solenoid, uh, a practical application for this solenoid is, is actuators in, in industry. They'll make things that movement, they cause movement to occur. Okay? You can open a door, you can close a valve, you can open a valve. All of, uh, almost all automation, um, Actuators are based off that simple principle. Even relays to control a larger current. You can have a small current here, control a large current with a, with a relay. Still, they're still used today. Um, I have some up here. I just didn't get a chance to show you. I have these little relays. So it's just a mechanical, co combining mechanical with electrical. And that's why they're called electromechanical. 
We have electromagnetic induction, 1831, the transformer, DC motors, relays. So around 1830s, induction coil, improved telegraph. So transatlantic cable, more things. You guys can look at these online. It's, it just kind of blew up. Then radio, 1900s, it was the, really the radio mm -hmm. era. And took off from there. Now there's some videos. You guys, I'm going to post this on you. Not YouTube, but I'll post this on Moodle, and you guys can watch these videos if you want. There's some good stuff there. Now, what Volta discovered was that um, the contact of two dis dissimilar metals would produce electricity. And he came up with a contact series of metals similar to the tribal electric series, similar to the thermal electric series. You know, we've, we've had three series now. The the tribal electric series is the series of substances that you can rub them and they'll produce a positive or negative. Then you have the um, thermoelectric series is the series of metals, different, different metals you put in contact with each other and then you heat them or cool them and it'll produce a voltage. Depending on the metals, there's a different effect. There's a different voltage. And then now we have a contact series of metals uh, without the need of heat. But really what you need there in the interim for this to really work is some sort of a, a chemical liquid or electrolytes what we call it <clears throat> so here is the uh, contact series and you can see that you have zinc and lead together will produce uh, 0.2 lead and tin will produce 0.069 tin and iron together will produce 0.3 now what he found is that you can put all these in series and stack them together and it will produce you know, whatever you add this up to be, one, one point something volts. Or you can just connect zinc with copper and you'll get the same effect. You don't really need all these metals in, the, in between. Okay, So that's one of the principles that Volta came up with. The difference um, of potential between any two metals is equal to the sum of the difference of any potentials between the intervening metals in the contact series. Current in a battery, he found that electricity could be supplied to a body as fast as it flowed away, and therefore, hence they they created their first continuous current. Whereas before, they were only able to generate frictional electricity, and then they were able to transfer it instantaneously. These are called voltaic cells. Uh, this was discovered. What tipped Volta off was Gal Galvani, who was more into medicine. He was trying to figure out what caused people to be alive. You know what the sparks of life I guess if right. you will without electricity we wouldn't exist so right. um, <clears throat> this was very interesting they were studying it the they connected two different metals to a frog's leg and it <laughs> moved like that mm -hmm. and so Volta properly said that actually it wasn't because of the frog that there was like energy in the frog because the frog I guess was dead of course but it was that um, the dissimilar metals and the chemical, which was the frogs, I guess, yucky stuff, created an electrolyte and caused, you know, they put it just on the right nerve and it caused it to flinch. So, <clears throat> weird way of uh, discovering batteries, but that was how it happened. <clears throat> and um, the only thing they had really instruments in those days, of course, is they had the um, they had the electroscope because we just did those experiments. Mm -hmm. But Volta used an electroscope, he used a battery, and he used a condenser, which I, I showed you guys the other day, was electrophorus, and he showed that um, the battery could produce, could cause the leaves to diverge in an electroscope. Okay, the battery. So, because no one really knew, at that time people thought, oh, there's all these different types of electricity, and they're different. Like, frictional electricity is different than the electricity in your body and it's different than the electricity in the in the air so they didn't connect all these things together yet so they were trying to prove to themselves that oh really the electricity when you rub two things is the same electricity that's in your body the same electricity that's in the air it's all the same because no one knew that right. at that time they just were ex experimenting with all these amazing mysterious things that no one really understood <clears throat> So they were able to show that it was the same, had the same properties. <clears throat> so
So what Vol the Voltaic pile was what he did was he had a zinc and copper like coins basically, mm -hmm. and he took cardboard, and yes they had cardboard back then, and they had brine. So they coat the it was coat the cardboard in brine, and they would put the zinc and the copper disc, and they just keep stacking those up, and that was a it would produce you know that could produce like 20 30 volts, mm -hmm. even though they was weak you know it was maybe 30 30 milliamps, but that was the first battery, you know. Uh, and at the Royal Institute in London, they produced one that had like five or six hundred in series and, and really wide places. So they had the the best battery in the world. And that's how all the experiments came out of, of the Royal Institute in, uh, in uh, London. <clears throat> I know in our history books, we learned that Americans invented everything, right? <laughs> it's not really true. Actually, what's really true is that Europeans were vastly ahead of us. Um, but we did have some smart people, and what really was a turning point for us was was um, Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison was a turning point for us, I think, in, in my research. Of course, they had a Thomas Edison in Europe too. His name was Warner von Siemens, and that's where Siemens come from. Okay. And General Electric is is um, Thomas Edison's company. Oh. It wasn't really his; it was more J.P. Morgan's. But that's what came out of it. <clears throat> Um, okay, so we're good. Crown of Cups, you take, just like we did today, you take zinc, copper, zinc, copper, zinc, copper, zinc, copper, you got brine in here, and you can make a battery. Okay? Um, and we showed the, the first simple voltaic cell. It was just exactly what we had. We had copper and zinc. And we found today that the copper was plus, because we have a nice fluke meter, which they didn't have. <laughs> So really, they had to define what positive was. They, they defined what positive was because um, they assumed everything was based off of glass. They, uh, they arbitrarily said glass, when you rub it, is positive, and plastic is minus. That's really what defined what positive and negative was. Someone just arbitrarily said, um, whatever is on glass, we'll just call it positive. That's where it came from. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. So it says, if however the two copper wires are made to touch one another, electricity will flow through the wires from the plus to the minus. It is found more of that the flow of electricity goes on continuously so long as the wires are joined. For there are set up certain chemical and electrical actions in the cell, very similar to the same chemical actions you saw when we're putting voltage through it to uh, break apart the molecules of the electrolyte. The same thing happens in reverse um, when you use it as a battery. <clears throat> which has a result of renewing the difference of potential and supplying electricity to the plus pole just as fast as electricity flows through the wire to the minus pole. In fact, this is a continuous current of electricity. At the same time, it will be noticed that a few bubbles of hydrogen gas appear on the surface of the copper plate, which we saw today. Now, I want to note, as I'm talking about this, we're not just talking about batteries today. We're talking also about what is current, what is current, what is voltage, okay, what is resistance some of the fundamental things that we're going to learn in this class. It will be found also that the zinc strip is slowly dissolving in the dilute acid. It's dissolving. You're dissolving metal in an electrolyte. Okay? You're extracting the hidden captured energy in that metal. You're extracting that out of it. That's why if you leave your batteries in your keyboard or whatever too long, they're all corroded. It's because it's, it, it's supposed to corrode. That's not a defect battery. It's, it's supposed to corrode. That's what it's doing. That's how it's generating the voltage. Um, it will be found that the zinc strip is slowly dissolving in dilute acid and that this action also goes on as long as the wires are joined. These chemical actions stop and the electricity ceases also to flow as soon as the wires are separated from one another. They begin when the circuit is made. That is the definition of circuit. So we're learning a lot more than just battery today. Right. We're learning what is a circuit. What is continuous current flow? A circuit is made is when you connect that copper and that zinc together. That's a full. That's a complete circuit. And we say that it goes around. It goes through the copper. It goes through the wire that you're connecting to. It goes through uh, the zinc, and then it goes through the electrolyte. Okay. 
And so two poles are joined, uh, more powerful flow. So you can put those in series and you get more powerful flow. Not more current, but just more voltage. Electromotive force, what is the term? See, now these, now I'm going to talk a little bit about your lab notebooks. These are the things you should be writing in your lab notebooks. I would put one, I would put 155, you know, put something way to reference it. And say electromotive force is defined as that which tends to move electricity. That goes in your lab notebook. Okay? Everything that I just highlighted above here goes in your lab notebook in your own words. Okay? Everything that I've just said, everything that I just underlined. In fact, I'll give you a, a tip on how I create tests. If I give you a reading assignment and I put those slides on, I expect you to know the reading assignment slides. What I'm going to do is I go through the slides and I say, I start reading this. Oh, that's important. I'm going to take that sentence right there, I'm going to put it in the test, and I'm going to take out one of those terms. The most critical term in there, I'm going to take it out, and I'm going to let them fill it in. So that's the way That's the way you make the test. That would be both right? Yeah. Yeah, that, well, the, the definition of electromotive force is not voltage. The definition of electromotive force is that w whatever tends to move electricity. Okay. A voltage, could, a, a, a voltage can be caused by a simple drop across the resistor. That is not tending to move electricity. That's actually tending to slow it down. Electromotive force is a is like a let's say you have a hydraulic system and you have a pump. The pump would be what we're calling a force. Right. Now the different elements and uh, uh, whatever you would have on that pump whether it would be a, a turbine or something like right. that to move an instrument to turn a shaft right. uh, that would not there would be a p potential difference across your load right. but we're using this is terminology here yes. okay now there's voltage across all those different elements when we talk about a, a series circuit but that doesn't mean that electromotive force and voltage drop and potential differences are all the same things they're, they're different things right. applied to the, the similar uh, a similar circuit. For example, we would say we have electromotive force, we have a wire, we have a resistor, and we have another wire. We connect those together. The electromotive force is the battery. It's tending to cause the electrons to move. Is the resistor tending to make the electrons move? No. Do they both have voltages across them? Yes. Do they both have potential differences across them? Yes. But the battery is the electromotive force. For brevity, we sometimes write EMF. Just as in water pipes, a difference of level produces a difference of pressure. This talks about what I just told you, so you, you can read that later. That's This discussion here, that, right here, is exactly what I, we just talked about. That there's a difference between those terms. The beginner must not confuse, confuse electromotive force or that which tends to move electricity with the electric force or force with which tends to move matter. <coughs> that, don't worry about that. Voltage laws. Voltage showed that the difference... Now look, notice through here that when I read this article, I, hi, I underlined and then I made notes of 1, 2, 3. Right. 1, 2, 3, I would say you should put voltage laws in your notebook. 1, 2, 3. In your own words. Sim you can make it a lot simpler than this if you want. Um, Voltage showed that the difference of potential between two metals. <coughs> okay. Difference of potential between two metals in contact depend merely on what metals they were, not on their size nor their surface mount. I already talked about that. Also, that when a number of metals touch one another, the difference of potential between the first and the last in the row is the same as if they touched one another. We already talked about that. Mm -hmm. And if in the row of cells the zincs and coppers are all arranged in one order so that all of them set up electromotive forces in the same direction, total electromotive force of the series will be equal to the electromotive force of one cell multiplied by the number of cells. Basically, it just means if you got three of those copper zinc arrangements in the correct order so as to add them, it'll be the same as one multiplied times three. So this is where we get into the math part of it. Okay, you can simplify things with math. So we're going from 0.9 plus 0.9 plus 0.9 to 0.9 times 3. That's what it says, really. <clears throat> Resistance, the same electrodome of force does not, however, always produce a current of the same strength. So that means batteries 
even though they may have the same voltage, they may be a different strength. The battery in your cell phone is not as strong as the battery in your car because the battery in your car has a lot of those plates in parallel. And if you short that, you, it's going to generate hundreds of amps, whereas your, one of your phones is going to generate maybe half an amp or an amp if you're lucky. <coughs> So they have a, they have internal resistance in that cell. Does anyone understand that? Yes, sir. There's an internal resistance inside the battery. You cannot remove it. It will always be part of that battery. Okay. Which, from a diagram standpoint, what that means is really. This battery, this cell, is really an ideal voltage source. We'll be talking about ideal voltage sources when we get through with this first module. Um, the first three-week portion is the first module. It is an ideal voltage source with a series resistance, R. That's the, that's the ideal model for a cell. Okay. This is V. We call this V today. The better term would be called the EMF. It's confused today because back when they were inventing this, when they were more knowledgeable, when you're inventing something, you're more knowledgeable. When you're 100 years later, you're watering everything down. That's why I'm letting you guys read. You guys are reading the pure stuff, the good stuff. The books you read today, the people who write it, they don't even know what they're talking about. Really? Most of them don't. Because if you read it, you're like, you don't. what is he talking about? Right. It, they're so vague that they, they really what they're doing is this they're it's like copy of a copy of a copy of a right. copy of a copy of a copy a hundred or twenty two hundred times. By the time you get to that level, it's right. been invented it was invented a hundred years ago. Yes, so you think it's gonna be watered down today? Yeah. Yes. The work they're doing on Ho Higgs boson today, they're more knowledgeable than they're gonna be a hundred years from now when when someone told someone someone to told someone someone told someone okay. and all the people that invented it are dead. And no one actually does experiments anymore. They just read about it. Okay. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> what does that represent right there? What's that the old model that you just? Created? You know what? We'll get into this later. But I wanted to expose you to now. Don't don't worry about it because I haven't even introduced <laughs> this stuff to you. Okay. This is the stuff we'll introduce later. Most people would would have started right here on day one. Okay. They would have started with this and this, and they would not have told you where this comes from. Okay. That's what, so that's what I'm doing. Um, resistance. The strength of the current depends not only on the force tending to drive the electricity around the circuit, but also on the resistance which it has to encounter and overcome its flow. Um, current will be weaker, although the EMF may be unchanged. <clears throat> the amount of water that runs through will depend not on the pressure alone, but the resistance it meets. This is a water type analogy. He says, the analogy of water will again help us. The pressure which flows... The pressure which, which forces the water through pipes depends on the difference of level between the cistern from which the water flows and the tap to which it flows. But the amount of water that runs through will not depend on the pressure alone, does it? No, but on the resistance it meets with. For if the pipe be a very thin one or choked with sand or salt, the water will only run slowly. So it does not only depend upon the electromotive force or the tendency to push electrons, but also upon the resistance which it encounters in the electrolyte itself is the main resistance. The electrolyte is the resistance. The, electro the liquid. Okay? Yeah. Sulfuric acid if in there. If I put sulfuric acid in that cup and manage not to touch myself with it because it would burn my finger off, then I put those plates in there and you could generate an amp or more. That's what's in a, a car battery. So if you're guessing. Yeah. Depends on what metal you have, but um but yeah, that's you can do that with this. It, it, the purpose of it the, the what he alluded to is gonna eat the metal, that's the point. The point is that it eats the metal. That's what the solution is doing. That's what makes it strong. So the stronger the acid, the more it's gonna eat eat that away, then the better the battery is going to be. Okay. <clears throat> now, the metal in, in general conduct... Oh, wait. The liquids in the battery do not conduct nearly as well as the metals. 
different li liquids have different resistances. So that's where you get the internal resistance. The resistance of the liquid in the cells may be reduced if desired by using larger plates of metal, putting them nearer together. Gases are bad conductors. So when the hydrogen bubbles start to come, the gases start to form. Now that's, you know, gases are bad conductors. So the electricity is not going to want to tend to flow there, so it's going to reduce the surface area of the of the metal so you have it's reducing the surface area so it's increasing the resistance by reducing the surface area of the metal because there's hydrogen there and with and which stick to the surface of the copper plates increase internal resistance of the cell diminishing the effective surface of the plates <clears throat> hence we get into the concept of polarization which again is, is something you'd write in your lab notebook and you would say polarization this is what polarization is bubbles of hydrogen gas liberated the surface of the copper plate the effective amount of the surface of the copper plate has been seriously reduced therefore the strength of the current after a few minutes falls off greatly a battery in this condition is said to be polarized <clears throat> the effects of the polarization is firstly to increase the resistance secondly it weakens the current by setting up electromotive force for hydrogen is almost as oxidizable a substance as zinc, especially when freshly deposited, and is electropositive. So there's two effects. There's it increases the resistance because of the gas, and gas is not non-conductive. And then also the uh, molecules themselves are, are electropositive or ionized. <clears throat> Hence, the hydrogen itself produces a difference. Of, so it, it has a, those actual atoms themselves have a, a force that's opposing what you're trying to do with the battery. <clears throat> so, what is the definition of a good battery? A good battery is one which its electromotive force should be as high as, as should be high and constant. Now this is assuming you want to do something useful and drive some powerful motor. Sometimes we want to have a, uh, these days we want to have a low voltage, a particular voltage like your cell phone. You only need like five or six volts there. <clears throat> Or three. So today, in, in today's environment, it's actually better to have a, a, a lower voltage on your devices because we found that um, the more the voltage, the more leakage in your digital uh, logic and your microprocessors, and the more heat. And anytime you have something that switches a digital circuit, um, it's dependent. It's it's. Uh, directly proportional actually to the square effect of your voltage and inversely proportional to your frequency um, <clears throat> I'm sorry it's proportional to the frequency of your clock and inversely proportional squared to the voltage so in a computer you want to have a low voltage because you have the, the heat the power every time the clock switches you're dumping current onto the capacitor you're dumping it to ground so it's a wasted energy so that's why today we want to have a lower one but if you want to drive a motor uh, electric generator I mean you, we have electric generator trying to drive an electric motor you're trying to power something then you want to have a high voltage because that's going to tend to force those electrons to move faster and with more current than a lower electromotive force <clears throat> for example if you have a fixed resistor and you have a one volt then you're going to have a current a current now if you double that voltage or, or that electromotive force then you're going to double that current now that's now we're starting to get into ohm's law alluding into ohm's law mm -hmm. <clears throat> its internal resistance should be small i don't think anyone wants a battery that has internal resistance i mean internal resistance is always bad you want it to have it as low as possible <clears throat> it should give a constant current so the idea for a battery the ideal for a battery is that it'll generate a constant voltage and until it just dies you know you don't want to have a battery that goes like this you know then dies because then your, your voltage is changing everywhere right. so the best thing is just to have a constant voltage and, and then eventually it's going to fail <clears throat> it's going to eat through all the the material <clears throat> your your liquids going to be saturated with uh, the elements of whatever metals you have <clears throat> It should be perfectly quiet or quiescent is what we use for quiet. It should be cheap and durable materials and uh, should be manageable. It should not emit corrosive fumes. The same thing that was true 100 years ago is the same today.
That's the same exact thing. <clears throat> Principles haven't changed. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, these hydrogen fuel cells that they're talking about a lot today in cars, this is when they were invented. Okay, this is when they knew the most about them. <clears throat> Edison actually made an electric car. Uh, Ed Thomas Edison uh, made this, he invented the current storage battery that we have today, but um, the the motor technology wasn't there at the time, and, and Edison was old at that point in his life. But if he was if he would have been able to live forever, then he you know we would have had technology increased greatly. Um, so you have different types of cells. Now all these cells have different possible uh, metals and different combinations, and they do different things mechanically to eliminate polarization. That's the main thing about these batteries: is trying to get over the effect of polarization, having you know different electrolytes and things like having different metals. So by combining different metals, different electrolytes, and different um, ways to el eliminate or combat polarization is how you wind up with with all the different types of designs and all these guys had their own types of batteries and like I said Edison he made years later um, about 19 1900s something like that Edison was made he perfected the battery we have today strength of the current uh, okay so this helps us understand current. Okay, what is current? The student must not mistake the figure, the figures given in the table above, for the strength of the current, which, which the various batteries will yield. That depends, as was said, on the internal resistance of the cells as well as their EMF. The EMF of the cell is independent of its size. The resistance depends on the size of the cell, the conducting qualities of the liquid, and the thickness of the liquid which the current must traverse. The exact definition of the strength of a current is the strength of a current is the quantity of electricity which flows past any point of the circuit in one second. <coughs> Actually, that turned out to be the definition of current. Okay? So, the quantity of electricity which flows past any point of a circuit in one second. Now, we talked about the other day having um, electricity generating stack electricity and transferring it from one object to another that was an instantaneous almost transfer that would constitute an instantaneous current but now we're talking about continuous flow of that and so now you get into this point of well if it's continuously flowing you're not just going to be talking it's harder to talk about quantity because before we had a certain quantity we could try to measure a quantity of electricity on a on a metal ball suspended by a silk st string because we knew it was there but now when we talk about electricity continuously flowing, you almost have to break it up into time divisions because it's continuously flowing. Now, how do you say, I've got so much current, I've got so much charge here? Well, the charge is continuously flowing. The amount of charge that passes a point is continuously increasing, right? It's kind of like the, the flux of cars that go down the interstate on I-40. It's continuously going. So now you, you really need to talk about the quantity of things in, you know, how many cars pass this point in a second or in an hour. Sometimes they do studies. How many cars pass this point in an hour? Because then um, that's going to give you a rate of change. That's what we call rate of change. <clears throat> Suppose that during 10 seconds, 25 coulombs, um, 25 coulombs. Suppose that during 10 seconds, <clears throat> Sorry, where's my mouse cursor at? 25 coulombs of electricity flows through a circuit. <clears throat> then the average strength of that strong current during the time has been 1.5 coulombs per second. Or 2.5 amps. So 2.5 coulombs per second is the same as 2.5 amps. In fact, that's the definition as defined by them because they invented it so therefore they defined it. <clears throat> if the, if in T seconds a quantity of electricity Q has flowed through the circuit then the current C now they used to use C for current but then they realized that they also wanted to use C for for charge <laughs> so they changed it so we changed C to I uh, <clears throat> okay so we use I today so we would say I is equal to Q over T 
Coulombs is the amount of charge, we call it. And then T is time. So this was something to go in your lab notebook. The definition of current. This is the definition of current. And you can re simply rearrange this equation, multiply both sides by T, or just think about it differently. Um, however, the way you want to think about it, if if you have a certain amount of current going past a point a certain amount of time, if you multiply it by that time, then you get the amount of charge, the amount of that current. So Q is equal to CT. This is the basic equation we use for capacitors. <clears throat> the laws which determine the strength of a current in a circuit were first enunciated by Dr. G uh, George Simon Ohm, stated the following law in 1827. This is a German. The strength of the current varies directly as the electromotive force and inversely as a resistance of the circuit. The strength of the current, back in those days they didn't write, they, they did a lot of word problems. The strength of the current, okay, through a resistive element. Now this does not say, yea verily, every element in the world has to be a resistor. It's saying, if the strength of a current through something, varies directly as the electromotive force and inversely as as resistance or the length of that wire then it is resistive that doesn't mean that everything is resistive right. that doesn't act like a resistor that lamp the other day didn't really act like a resistor because why <laughs> the the resistance changed depending on what how much current was flowing through it right so that's non ohmic we call that non ohmic That means that you do not get a straight line when you, if you increase the voltage here on a chart. Mm. <clears throat> well, I should say better draw here. That's non-ohmic. So, <clears throat> what so an ohmic device would be if I if I if I put in one volts and two volts and three volts into a device over here. I don't know what the what's in the device. I don't really care. Mm. And if I measure the current through it. <clears throat> An ohmic device would have a straight line. It could be like that. It could be like this. It could be like that. Mm -hmm. if, they have, if it has a really steep line, then that means that what? Low. Yeah, low resistance. Because if if you just if you put a voltage across it and the current goes way up, it's low resi It's low resistance. It's, it's resisting the flow of current a little. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> now the <clears throat> the bulb the other day that we had when we put when we measured it with our voltmeter we were basically just putting a little bit of current through it not enough to make it heat up so we're putting a little bit of a voltage across it okay as we started to, as it started to heat up as we put more current through it what happened so it would have looked something like this right so this is a bulb and this is a resistor okay or in other words anything that makes the MF of the cell greater will increase the strength of the current while anything that increases resistance will diminish the strength of the current either the internal resistance in the cells themselves or the resistance of the external wires. That's the key point. You you cannot you always have the internal resistance of the battery, the EMF itself, the cell. Even those power supplies over there have have uh, re internal resistance, although they're small, 0 0.001 or it could be one milliohm. That's still something, and that still matters. Um, especially when you sort when you sort something, what you're seeing is that internal resistance. So that matters, because if it was, if it was infinite, every, all the conductors would just fuse instantaneously, would just melt. <clears throat> we may then increase the strength of the battery in two ways: I by increasing the EMF or diminish its internal resistance. So that's the two ways of increasing the strength, I guess, of a battery. The only way to increase the total EMF of a battery of given materials is to increase the number of cells. 
So a lot of work is put into diminishing the internal resistance, you can imagine. <laughs> uh, to diminish the um, internal resistance of a cell, uh, the following impediments may be resorted to. Plates can be brought near together. Some of the plates increase. Zinc of several cells can be joined together. Um, also, it says simple series. By putting cells in series, you double the EMF. By putting them in parallel, you increase the current capability of those cells. Or in other words, you diminish its internal resistance because those internal resistors are actually now in parallel. And we'll talk about that later. Um, actually, we should talk about it now because really this should lead into that. So how do I make a battery stronger? If I've got, if I've got a certain cell, certain cell, that has, let's say it has 10 ohms of resistance and that's not good enough for us. Let's say we really wanted that, that battery once shorted. Um, let's say this is one volt battery, one cell, one volt cell, I keep saying battery. A battery, what, what's a battery? A battery was um, like a gun battery, you have an artillery battery. A, a battery, the, the idea of a battery is, is a lot of something. That's what a battery is. It's multiple multiple of something okay. so they're really the word battery means multiple so when you say battery you're you're saying more than one cell in series that's what a battery is so a battery is if you take two of these cells and put them in series you say you have a battery of cells so, but, but sometimes we use the word battery incorrectly a C a C size cell is is a cell a 9 volt battery is a battery because there's actually six cells inside of a nine volt but technically a, it's a, it should be called a, a, a triple a cell a double a cell a c cell and a d cell and a nine volt battery <clears throat> so if i shorted this together here i would get how much current i is equal to v over r so what i get 0.1 amps right because I got one over ten resistance. Mm -hmm. Now, if I wanted to say, I, oh, I really need, say, I really need point, uh, you know, I need more. I need point two five amps, right? So, how can you do that? Yeah. So, if I put two of these in series, what would I get for the my total? If I put two of these in series, then I would wind up with an effective 5 ohms internal resistance. In parallel. <coughs> in parallel, I'm sorry, parallel. So I put two of these 10 ohms in parallel like that. The effective is going to be that I'm going to have one that has 5 ohms. Okay? So now I've doubled my current capability of that battery, right? What's one? What's one divided by five? Point. Yeah. Now one divided by point five, or I'm sorry, five, <laughs> is point two. Right. Because we got five ohms, we got one volts. V one. Okay, so. That's how you can increase the strength of, of your battery. <clears throat> so, modern batteries. We jumped all the way to the modern era. <clears throat> we got the D cell. We got the uh, the 9 volt, you can see, is just six cells inside of there. That's what the 9 volt is. You see that? Yes, sir. Okay. Here's what's inside our battery. Yucky stuff. <laughs> I forgot what the composition is. But this is basically like a paste. It's electrolyte. It's a paste electrolyte. That's a dry They call it dry cell. It's not really dry. <laughs> um, they just, it's kind of like what they said in those days. They put sawdust in there so it wouldn't spill. The same kind of thing. They put some, they kind of make a paste out of it. It's really it's the what, the material here. Um, I think this is like a carbon rod or something. 
or a gra I mean graphite rod or something like that. <clears throat> it's really it's the the chemical properties of that. Okay. So you have the cell <coughs> symbol. You need to know what the cell symbol is. This represents copper. This represents zinc for a simple cell. This is a solar cell symbol. This is representing that when light comes into it, it produces a voltage. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I'm going to put all this on Moodle. Now here's a modern battery, a, a car battery. You can see that these plates are very large and parallel. And Edison basically invented that battery. There's some more videos. Now I'm just going to go through these like super fast because the time's up. Thermal electricity was basically electricity um, that if you have two different junctions and you heat it, it causes a voltage to flow. And we're not really going to be tested on that, but I wanted to show you really quickly that uh, back in the day, actually George Simon Ohm actually used the thermal pile. Um, sort of like a voltaic pile. The thermal pile was you take two different metals and you stick them in series, same principles of the battery, and you heat those junctions and it will actually create a voltage. So back in those days, this, you can, this is an example of a, uh, a gas lamp, you see here? And they're using the heat from the lamp to make a thermal electric generator. I heard that the Germans had something like this to power their radios. They, so they have a lamp and that heat would create a, a heat across that junction. This is just metal. That's all this is. Just different metals inside there. Just weave together a bunch of them. And it would just produce a voltage. So it's very like camp, campish type thing. You know, if you're right. camping, <laughs> you go right. camping. You got heat. All you need is heat. Uh, and you can see this. This was powering a. Uh, the Russians announced that they, you know, that they had this thing. And we today with thermoelectric coolers, those coolers you buy for your car, you plug in. That's what it is. If you actually, you can, do, if you um, put the current through dissimilar metals, depending on which way you put the current, either positive or negative, you can actually make it heat it or cool. One side will be hot, one side will be cold. So you make a cooler. And of course, you have uh, the thermal couple is for measuring heat in the lab. It's just two different metals fused together. There's no, there's no magic in the, there's no, nothing magical or electronic. Um, and I'll put the rest of these on the slide. We talked about this a little bit. Electromagnetism, when current flows through a wire, it produces a magnetic field. That field will move a compass. We already talked about that. And that's the basic principles beh beh behind how the galvanometer or the analog meter works. It's just a coil of wire and a needle and with a spring okay and that's all it is and the magnetic rotations that go around a the wire um, they follow the right hand rule so if the if the current goes along your thumb then the magnetic field will wrap around just like your fingers do right here so that your thumb is the conventional current conventional current so de so depending on which way it flows notice that um, this magnetic field, they both tend to add to one another on the inside of the wire. If you have a wire going like this and then coming back. So that's the basic principle of, of how that works. Right. If you have two wires next to each other in the twisted pair, the principle behind the twisted pair wire is that those magnetic fields will cancel because the current is flowing opposite directions, actually. So let's say you have a Ethernet cable or you have a POTS, regular telephone what they do is they twisted pair. They twist two wires together mm -hmm. because they're trying to minimize the space in between the wires. That's why they twist them really tightly together. Right. Because the magnetic fields, if they follow the right hand rule, will cancel in the middle. Okay. Uh, actually, the, in the middle, you have that magnetic field that builds up. So if you put them really close together, you have no magnetic field okay. in, in between them. Right. Because the, the magnetic field flows around if you follow the right hand rule and it tends to add or increase the magnetic field. It ba basically makes an electromagnet between those two wires. Electromagnet between the two wires. Just like the electromagnet here. That's why we wrapped it around in circles. Because we're trying to, to capture that magnetic field. But when you do a twisted pair of communications, you don't want that effect 
we'll talk about that later, but that's because um, that magnetic effect takes time to build up and it takes time to, to decay away and it induces voltages onto the wire, which prevents the wire from being able to switch more rapidly. So there's a delay, there's a delay effect. The magnetic field comes and goes slowly. So it's like it drags along. It's kind of like um, mass. It's kind of like mass. Uh, the magnetic field, if you think of pushing a large object versus a small object, okay? The magnetic field is, is, is like a mass to the electron. Just like we talked today, if you have, the, if you coil these together, then you can produce the same effect that you, you do as, as a magnet. And we showed that over there on the, the slides. We showed that these two were the same, right? Okay. So everybody's good with that? And there's some videos there that you can watch. So in summary, sorry to, to kept you over a little bit. In summary, we learned that um, you can create electromotive force from two, diff two dissimilar types of metal in a liquid electrolyte which is acidic um, and the stronger the acid the lower the impedance of that battery is going to be and that you saw the relationship between internal resistance of a battery and current we define what current is we talked about what electromotive force is the difference between electromotive force and voltage and the difference between that and the potential difference what the terminology means we talked about once you the effect of that current. Once that current is flowing now, what effect does it have on other things? It creates electromagnets. Okay, those electromagnets behave like magnets. Those electromagnets can move uh, a nail, which can be used to create a instrument for measuring current. Therefore, we have test equipment. And we can use that magnetic effect to create a relay, which is used in automation and actuators. So that's it. Thanks. We don't need to know dates, names, or just no. facts. No. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna ask you about the dates, even though it's. Or who was it? Some of the things I tell you is just fluff for interest. Right. And some of it, like the technical terms, right. what is current, what is voltage, what is charge, what happens when I put a, two metals, does it produce a voltage? You know. Those are the technical aspects of it. I only care about the technical aspects of it. Oh, yeah, actually, I do. Sorry, guys, did everyone leave? Um, read. Actually, no, I don't think I do. No, we don't. We don't have reading assignment. Okay. We, do, we don't have reading. So maybe we can catch up on the reading. Yeah, actually, just go ahead and read that assignment that you have because um, we're, 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 we're going to be done with that. Notes. We're done with that book now. Oh, really? So just finish reading it and make sure you understand everything. There. Yeah, we're done with that book. With the particular, with the particular things you had us read, didn't it, anyway? I believe you're done. I'm, don't hold me to that, but I, I believe that we're done with that book. Okay. There may be a few couple more sections I have to read, but for okay. the most part, we're done with that book. Okay. And go back and take notes on things that we didn't take notes Yeah. On. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Toss, to have a yep. weekend, boy. You too.
So you we're, we're building it on English? Yeah, because, well, like, oh, yeah. I mean, like, the dates are fine, but what's messing with my previous I'm school. waiting this one, wait, I'm waiting to get this out. Oh, yeah, you can do it. Back school, and right. now they're just showing, like, that shit. Hopefully I won't. They did already, and they're not giving me any leeway with that, which is not a big deal or the way it's that's just what it is. Yeah. And, that, and there's like, I don't know if it's all or some stuff. Good. There's a lot of stuff. Well, I lost there. it one time. Uh, well, I didn't well, see, yeah, I'm not going to do a lot of that because I'm, not, I'm more of just an advisor as far as like, I can't really classes to take. Parts say, yes, that's that's yeah, what my that's mind mostly what I can do. I don't really have the ability or the access. I didn't do it. I don't know what There's a. Yeah, yeah, they got to pull that up. Yes, yeah, sir. That's why they got your list. Like, I was yes, sir. originally uh, left hand uh, corner. My advisor, right. then it was Ron Davis. Okay. Davis. Okay. Davis. Okay. Davis. Okay. Davis. Okay. Davis. okay. It was back and forth. And then each right. time I went to the wrong way, they just wanted to Okay. Okay, well, you can come to me. Yes, that's the story. I want to make sure I'm just saying. All right. Thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah. You can come today. We'll go over it. I think that's going to be due Monday, right? What is that? Some of our next uh, our next fab lab is. Yes, sir. The next fab lab is Monday? No, Tuesday. Yes, Monday. It's Monday? Monday afternoon. Yes, sir. Hopefully I'll have it done. I got a funeral. My uncle died, so all um, weekend is gonna be and I've got my boys this weekend. But Got to get this homework done. Take care, Mr. Don. Have a good weekend, buddy. All right. Yeah, before we go, long haired fella come in. You and I were having a conversation. Uh, the guy yesterday came and bought you the, the cup from NASA. Uh huh. You and I were talking about uh, uh, the rocketry. I've got, I'm into it. Uh, I've been into it since I was a kid, so I got my little into the building the ST's rockets. Oh, yeah. Nowadays they're more pre I mean you still gotta do some 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 building to it, but back when I got into it, everything you had to put everything. It wasn't enough to put a cardboard tube and some balls in wood. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah I, I, these days they're all built huh? well not really they're not really all built but they're a lot of stuff's plastic. Uh -huh. You put the fins on, you don't have yeah. to, you don't have to take measurements and actually glue each individual fin on like you used to back then. Now I'm uh, sure they yeah. have some kits that are a little more advanced, but back whenever I got into it, you, you had, had to, to build your like on wood fins and stuff? Yes sir. A lot of balsa wood and stuff. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. I, I, it's a, it's a, I think it's a cool hobby to get into with my, with my kids and stuff. If they're learning while they're playing, while they're having fun, so yeah, I'm, I'm that rocket tree interests me. It's intriguing. Well, thanks, Mr. Halstead. You yeah. have a great weekend, buddy. Oh, you too, man. All right, bud.